Welcome to Spring Creek Church. Whether you are joining us at our Garland campus or online, we are so glad that you are here today. If you would like to know more about our church, text NEW to 96995. And if you are attending our Garden campus, be sure to stop by Community Life in the lobby. We have a lot of great events that are happening this month. Here are just a few to check out. Be sure to visit springcreekchurch.org slash events for more details and to register. Here at Spring Creek, we believe that life change happens in community. It's so important to have a group of people that you can do life with. We have some amazing groups, both online and in person, that you can join. Visit springcreekchurch.org slash groups to see all the groups we have available and to sign up. Thanks for being with us today. We're in week two of our Rated PG parenting series for Parental Guidance Needed. Uh, we're just really trying to cover a lot of the big ideas behind what it makes for great parenting and, and how to raise kids that really, like today's message, learn to connect choices and responsibility. As we get started in this message, bow your heads with me for a moment. Let's pray together. Lord, we're grateful that you are with us in this moment, that God, wherever we may be uh, in our personal life or wherever we might be, whether at home or traveling or whatever the circumstances, God, you're with us in this moment and we're gathering now around your word. And we're just asking that you would have complete freedom in our time together to speak to the needs in our life, whatever they may be. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You know, without a doubt, the best summation of the parenting challenge is that we're to help our children learn to take responsibility for themselves and for their actions. In order to do that, we have to become adept at connecting choices and consequences. Personally, I've never seen or heard a better explanation of what that process looks like than by Dr. Sylvia Rim. Now, Dr. Sylvia Rim is a well-known child psychologist she was the director of the Family Achievement Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio, was a clinical professor at Case School of Medicine, and also a best-selling author. Dr. Rim came up with this illustration of what she called the V of love. So think of the sides of the V as representing firm limits within which a child can make decisions and live with the consequences of those decisions. The bottom of the V represents birth, while here at the top, that represents adulthood. So when you look at this chart, you see that when we're young, we have fewer choices. As we get older, more choices open up to us because we're learning to take responsibility for our choices. The whole point is, as we age, as we mature, parents help their children make the connection between good choices that are followed by good results and bad choices that are followed by bad results. That's what maturity is all about. A child who has internalized that truth so that they take ownership over their own decisions because they've learned that choices determine consequences. That way, by the time they reach adulthood, there are no more limits on their freedom or choices because they've learned how important it is to make good choices and they do that all on their own. That's the goal of parenting. Parents are trying to work themselves out of a job. Now, some of you may be wondering, what's any of that got to do with the Bible? Well, everything. One of the basic things of Scripture is that with maturity comes greater responsibility. Parent, parenting is really getting kids ready for that reality. We see the same pattern in the Jewish tradition of bar mitzvah. That's when a Jewish boy is moved from the status of a boy with few choices to that of an adult with far more choices. So when a boy is bar mitzvahed or a girl is bat mitzvahed, he or she is placed in the family with a new standing, having the rights and privileges of an adult. So just like Dr. Rim teaches, the older a child gets, the more choices and freedom they have, coupled with a greater sense of responsibility. I think the V of love is a good representation of what God intends for the family. Kids grow into responsible decision-making by being given opportunities when they're younger to make a few choices on their own and live with the consequences of those choices. Over time, they're learning that good choices bring good results, bad choices bring bad results, so that by the time they're adults and the price tag on bad decision-making has gone up considerably, they know how to think on their own without being told that they need to make good decisions. 
But here's what happens in far too many families. The V of love gets inverted. Some parents treat their kids like they're little adults. They give too many choices too soon, honestly, before the child's really ready for it or can even handle it. We call this over-empowerment. So Dr. Rim said the telltale sign of over-empowerment in younger children is when your child begins to try to negotiate every rule with you. Now, I'm not talking about adolescence here. That's really normal behavior for teenagers. But when they're four, five, six years old and they're trying to negotiate every rule, you've probably given them too much too soon. So when a parent inverts the V and a child is given too much freedom or too many choices, as a result of that, they will fail repeatedly because they can't handle it. The parents are then forced to cut back on their freedom, cut back on their choices, so that by the time they're teenagers and should be entering a time of more unlimited choice, they're actually regressing and a teen is being treated like a five-year-old. When that happens, I don't think I have to tell you, guess what you have on your hands? A rebellious teenager. Why? Because people always compare the amount of control they have in a relationship now with what they used to have. The kid is seeing their freedom and choices dry up, so they resent it. Ideally, when we do this the right way, slowly giving more choices as a child does well with the limited choices they have, then we're able to give our kids more and more freedom over time. Not only are our kids more satisfied, but they're also managing it well. Dr. Foster Klein with Love and Logic Institute made this comment. A child who feels he has some control over his life will spend little time and energy trying to manipulate and control the parent. It's usually the most controlling parents that have the most out of control kids. Now, I don't know about you, but by the time my kid gets to be a teenager, I want them to have had plenty of practice at making good and bad choices so that they know the difference. Because this is our task as parents. We want to help our children develop internally what we have been providing for them externally. But that's not as easy as it sounds, and sometimes well-meaning parents actually sabotage this developmental process. So let's talk about the things that sabotage your child's growth. You've probably heard this saying before, we've met the enemy and it is us. It's actually a quote of Oliver Perry, but contrary to popular opinion, Many of the worst kids, the most rebellious and disrespectful, often come from homes where they've been shown love, boundless love. It's just the wrong kind of love. So let me introduce you to the first saboteur of teaching kids responsibility, and these are the rescuers. The rescuers' motto is, I don't want to hurt my kids. Now, another word for rescuers is helicopter parents. These parents are constantly hovering over their kids and rescuing their kids whenever they get into trouble. They're the parents that you see running permission slips and homework and lunches up to the school after the day has started. What they end up doing, whether they mean to or not, is shielding their kids from consequence. So rather than letting their kid fail an assignment because they left their homework at home, they run it up to school to make sure the kid gets a good grade. But the kid is not learning responsibility when a parent does that. They're not having to remember to put their homework in their backpack because mom and dad will always be there to bail them out. But what if mom and dad didn't do that? Yes, the kid would get a failing grade that day on that paper, but it's not the end of the world. And more importantly, they're learning the consequence of irresponsibility. When you fail to take your homework to school, you get a bad grade for that assignment. Do it often, you might actually fail that subject. Do it too much, and your choices might mean staying in the same grade level another year and making whole new friends while all your old friends advance to the next grade. Kids have to learn that bad decisions have bad consequences or they'll never learn to be responsible. For most kids, once or twice is all it takes for the message to get through. They'll learn quickly. I've got to be responsible and bring my homework to class. And they'll learn that as long as mom and dad don't get in the way of learning. Of course, all of this hovering over their kids and rescuing them is done in the name of love and not wanting to see their children get hurt. In the Bible, David is an example of a helicopter parent, at least with an Adonijah he was. Look at this verse. His father, this is David, had never interfered with him by asking, why do you behave as you do? Adonijah ended up with major problems in his life. The word I want you to notice in the verse I just read is the word interfered. You know what that word really means? It means vexed or displeased. 
So what the verse is saying is David never wanted to displease his son or vex him in any way, which is why he was always running interference for him. Adonijah was irresponsible, and it was all because David was afraid of hurting him or displeasing him in any way. Now, I get it. I understand why parents don't want their kids to hurt. My goodness, it's tough to see a kid make a bad decision, then suffer for it, especially when you know you could do something about it. But folks, every time we run interference, we rob our children of a learning opportunity. Parents that are afraid to let their children hurt need to remember this. Growth always involves pain. Doctors Henry Cloud and John Townsend write a lot about the laws of sowing and reaping, which is something the scriptures teach in Galatians 6-7. One of the parents' greatest temptations is to interrupt the law of sowing and reaping in the name of helping their children. Listen to this. Sometimes, however, people don't reap what they sow because someone else steps in and reaps the consequence for them. If every time you overspent, your mother sent you money to cover check overdrafts of high credit card balances, you wouldn't reap the consequences of your spendthrift ways. Your mother would be protecting you from the natural consequences, the hounding of creditors, or going hungry. What, what Cloud and Townsend are saying is the law of sowing and reaping can be interrupted. You can interfere with this law by stepping in and rescuing your child from an irresponsible choice. But rescuing a person from the natural consequences of his or her behavior enables them to continue in that irresponsible behavior. Listen to what else Cloud and Townsend had to say about this. The law of sowing and reaping has not been repealed. It's still operating. But the doer is not suffering the consequences. Someone else is. Today, we call a person who continually rescues another person a codependent. In effect, codependent, boundaryless people co-sign the note of life for the irresponsible person. Then they end up paying the bills, physically, emotionally, and spiritually, and the spendthrift continues out of control with no consequences. He continues to be loved, pampered, and treated nicely. Parents who are afraid to let their children hurt need to remember that there's a huge difference between hurting someone and harming someone. Now, the best illustration I can give you to you of this is a, is a trip to the dentist. Now, I've had some great dentists in my life, great dentists who knew how to give a shot with minimal pain, but it still hurts to get a shot in your mouth, no matter how good your dentist is. So what the dentist does hurts, maybe ever so slightly, but it hurts. But let me ask you this, does the dentist harm you? No, they don't. What they do actually helps you. So I may hurt, but I'm not harmed. Now let's talk about what took me to the dentist in the first place. Sugar from sweets and soft drinks. Now did those sweets hurt me? No, not at all. Trust me on this. Those sweets were really, really good. But did they harm me? Absolutely. That's what caused the cavity. Parents who say they don't want to hurt their kids are like sweets to your teeth. They don't hurt their kids, but they do long-term harm because they're robbing their kids of learning opportunities. To the kids, it feels great, <laughs> but in the long run, it's really just causing harm. Allowing your children to hurt a little bit now is better than allowing them to be harmed. It's better to hurt a little now while the price tag for irresponsibility is still affordable than to let them learn it later in life when the price tag for irresponsibility can be devastating. A second approach some parents take, which is a sure way to sabotage learning responsibility, are the avoiders. Their motto is, if I ignore it, it'll go away. Some parents believe that they can just ignore disciplinary issues and they'll just kind of resolve themselves. Here's what the Bible says. Young people are prone to foolishness and fads. The, the, the cure comes from tough-minded discipline. You see, what this verse says is that foolishness is bound up in the child's heart and it takes discipline to cure it. By the way, foolishness does not mean childishness. It means irresponsibility. You know, sometimes an avoider will tell themselves, you know, it's just harmless kid stuff. You probably heard that phrase. Look at this verse. Discipline your children while they're young enough to learn. If you don't, you're helping them destroy themselves. That's Proverbs 19, 18. The Bible says, if I refuse to discipline my kids, then I'm participating in their destruction. In other words, if you love somebody, you're going to care enough about them to correct them. Permissiveness just doesn't cut it. We're trying to raise adults who take responsibility for themselves. And that's just never going to happen if I ignore what should be addressed. 
You see, when you put up with inappropriate behavior, hoping it'll go away, it never does. Instead, it escalates. At the same time, resentment starts building inside of you. Then once you can no longer hold back all that stuff you've been trying to suppress, you blow up. Cloud and Townsend in their book, Boundaries with Kids, call this the ignore and zap approach. In other words, you can only ignore something for so long, then without warning, you explode because you just can't hold it in any longer. The main problem with ignore and zap is that it teaches the child that they should persist in their bad behavior. You say, how's that? Well, because they've learned that they can get away with murder nine times out of 10 and only have to endure an out-of-control parent one time in 10. Those are pretty great odds. You'd be eager to invest in the stock market if you were guaranteed a 90% success rate. So ignoring bad behavior, hoping it will go away, it just doesn't work. Then there are those parents that we call overreactors. They say things like, do this because I'm the dad or do this because I'm the mom. Another term for overreactors is drill sergeants. Now, don't get me wrong. Drill sergeants love their kids. They think the more they bark, the more they control the bad choices the kids are going to make, the better off their kids are going to be. Even though they seem to be complete opposites, I want to tell you that helicopter parents and drill sergeants are a lot alike. That's because they're both trying to prevent their children from experiencing painful consequences. The helicopter parent does it by stepping in to interrupt the natural flow of consequence. The drill sergeant does it by never allowing their kids to make a decision that has a painful consequence. Here's God's word to drill sergeants. And now a word to you parents. Don't keep on scolding and nagging your children, making them angry and resentful. Rather, bring them up with the loving discipline the Lord himself approves with suggestions and godly advice. Notice how Paul said we're to correct our children. He said with loving discipline, with suggestions, with godly advice. Now, I want you to keep that in mind for later because we'll come back to it. Or how about this from Colossians 3.21? Fathers, don't scold your children so much that they become discouraged and quit trying. Now, if you were raised by a drill sergeant parent, you, you quickly learned how to hide your behavior from that parent. Honestly, one of the worst things we can teach our kid is to make decisions based on who's going to get mad. I mean, think about it. If your teenager is out in the family car and is tempted to show off for her friends, should she be thinking, you know, if I wreck this car, dad's really going to be mad? Or should she be thinking, gee, if I crash this car, I might splatter me and all my friends all over the highway. I'd better be careful. You see, kids need to be asking themselves, how is this decision going to affect me, not who's going to get mad and how do I keep them from getting mad? Because if you make your decisions based on whether or not your parents are going to get mad, then what, what happens when you learn that there's a lot of things you can do without your parents ever finding out about it? I mean, let's be honest. How many of us today did things as a teenager that your parents never knew about and still don't know about to this day? That's the point. So are you sending a covert message to your kids that the difference between good decisions and bad decisions is the bad decisions make you mad? If that's all they learned, they really haven't learned anything. Something else, drill sergeants will often use things like guilt and fear and even shame to get their kids to toe the line. This is an example of a Pyrrhic victory. Do you know what a Pyrrhic victory is? In ancient Greece, there was this well-known king. His name was Pyrrhus. And in 281 BC, Pyrrhus crossed into southern Italy to help a friend who was at war with Rome. When Pyrrhus left Greece, he had 25,000 men and 20 elephants. Even though Pyrrhus won the battle, he lost two-thirds of his army and was forced to completely withdraw from Italy. After that battle, Pyrrhus said this, Another such victory, and I shall be ruined. That statement gave rise to the term Pyrrhic victory. We use it to describe any victory that's obtained at too great a cost. A lot of parents achieve Pyrrhic victories through anger, guilt, and shame. You know why it's a Pyrrhic victory? Because fear works. Shame works. Guilt works. It works quickly. It'll get you instant results. That's why a lot of parents use it. But when you use guilt, fear, or shame to get your kids compliance, you may win the battle but ultimately you're gonna lose the war. Sure, you get them to do what you're telling them to do in the moment, but you're creating a pattern that's going to cause problems for your kids for years to come. You see, what you're actually teaching your kids is to crater to peer pressure. Because when you use guilt, shame, or you scare someone into doing something, 
You're setting them up to be motivated by the expectations of others rather than by their own internal compass. You're turning them into people who are easily manipulated by other people. Because that's what peer pressure is. It's letting the crowd, the expectations of others, determine your behavior. So do you want, what do you want your kid to be guided by? Their own internal compass or by the need to be accepted by other people? You may think powering up on your kid is the best way to get them to obey, but I can tell you this, that may get you what you want, but you're not producing a thinking kid. You're producing a weakened child, a child that's easily manipulated, a child who's not having to think about the consequences of their choices other than it makes you mad. And that leads us to this. There really is a better way. And the first principle I'm going to teach you is learning while the price tag is still affordable. Here's the deal. Kids today are suffering from inflation. The cost of learning how to live in the real world is going up every single day. The price a child pays today to learn about poor decision making will always be cheaper than it's going to be tomorrow. The older your kids get, the bigger the decisions are and the more significant the consequence will be. Wouldn't you agree that kids today face far more serious decisions with far more serious consequences than what we faced in high school? That's why I say they can hurt a little today or hurt a lot tomorrow. At least when your kids are young, the price tag on a bad decision is still affordable. Zig Ziglar once said, the child who's not been disciplined with love by his little world, the family, will be disciplined generally without love by the big world. Think of it like this. What's the consequence when a kid fails to turn in their homework or forgets their permission slip for a field trip? Will they die? No. Will they get kicked out of school? Nope. Will they have to pay for their mistake for the rest of their life? No way. They may get a lower grade on that assignment or miss out on a fun trip. Sure, they won't like it, might even be upset. But what else will they get? They'll get a valuable lesson in responsibility. Now, suppose a kid is always rescued from those small consequences. That means they're not learning responsibility. If they never learn responsibility and then they become an adult, how does the marketplace treat those who won't do their work or won't do it in a timely way? immediate and painful consequences. You probably won't keep your job. So as parents, we've got a choice. Let them hurt a little now or hurt a whole lot later. Always remember this, the best solution to any problem lies within the skin of the one with the problem. So when we intrude into our children's problems in anger or on a rescue mission, we make their problems our problems. And if you're going to worry about their problems, then they don't have to. They figure there's no use both of us worrying about it. So is it ever appropriate to rescue a child from a poor decision? Actually, yes, there is. How do you know when to step in and when not to? Well, the situations where parents definitely need to step in are these. Number one, danger of life or limb. I mean, you don't let your kid walk out into traffic and say, let me know how that works out for you. Another scenario, a decision that will affect the rest of their life. When you see your child is making a bad decision that will have a life-altering consequence and they're choosing poorly, you need to step in on that one. Or three, when the child really cannot cope. If you see your child is truly floundering, not having the physical, mental, or emotional strength to handle the consequence of a poor decision, in those cases, definitely, you need to step in. In most all other cases, A child needs to have the space to make a bad decision and learn from the negative consequence that accompanies it. Let me show you what this might look like in this next point that I'm calling, whenever possible, give choices instead of orders. So as parents, we should never give a choice on an issue that is truly a non-negotiable. And for each choice we do give, there should only be two options, either of which you'd be okay with. As an example, uh, it would be like if your kid doesn't want to wear their coat and it's really cold outside. You can simply ask, would you like to wear your coat or carry it? That way, once you get to where you're going and they start complaining about being cold, you don't have to stop what you're doing because they were being irresponsible and decided not to wear a coat. They either have it with them or on them. So it doesn't create a problem for you. Or if your kid is angry and yelling, you can say, you can stay with us and stop yelling or leave for a while and come back when your voice is as calm as mine. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't like to be around angry, yelling kids, so I use this one on my girls a lot. 
They get all worked up and I say, listen, you can stay here and stop raising your voice or you can go to your room, get it, get it under control and come back when your voice is as calm as mine. You know, probably one of the best illustrations of this is a story that Jim Fay with the Love and Logic Institutes once shared. It's about a six-year-old boy named Marty. So I want you to picture this family. There's mom, there's dad, there's Marty, and they're seated in a fast food restaurant. Mom and dad are finishing up the last of their fries and drinks and starting to gather up their stuff so they can get to the mall before it closes. But not Marty. He's blowing bubbles in his Coke. He's playing airplane with his French fries. He's barely touched his hamburger. So mom starts, hurry up and eat. We got shopping to do. Marty just continues playing. Then dad jumps in. Can't you do something with that kid? The mall's going to be closed by the time we get there. So mom picks up the hamburger, tries to guide it to Marty's mouth, but he's not falling for the open wide for the airplane bit. Next come the threats. You hurry up and eat that thing, or you know what's going to happen? We'll go shopping without you and just leave you here. That's followed by, I mean it, <laughs> which really means I'm losing it right now. Of course, Marty's not buying it because he knows mom and dad aren't going to leave him at the restaurant. So dad says, okay, that's it. Let's just leave. We'll call the cops and let them come take care of Marty. Can I tell you what the actual problem is here? The parents are trying to control something they couldn't control. Did Marty's mom and dad have to control the amount of food in Marty's stomach? No, they didn't. Did they need to control when their car was leaving? Yes, they did. They're fighting the wrong battle to begin with. So let's look at this scenario in a different way. First, you don't tell the kid what he has to do. You tell him what you're gonna do. When Marty refuses to eat, we say, no problem, Marty. My car is leaving in five minutes, and there's two ways you can go. Hungry is one way, not hungry is the other. Now you've got five minutes of tranquility before you leave. Now let me remind you, you don't have to nag Marty over the next five minutes about finishing his hamburger. That's not the issue. You said what you're going to do, and that's enough. You also don't have to be the countdown clock. We're leaving in four minutes, now three minutes, now two minutes. You don't have to remind Marty that he's going to be hungry if he doesn't eat that food. You've told him once, that's all he needs. If he doesn't follow through, you'll let the consequence be the teacher, and that will be far more effective than any of your words. So in five minutes, you, you stand up and you tell him, the car is leaving now. And if he's chosen to ignore you, which he probably has, he'll say, but I'm not ready. Again, this is not the time for a lecture. You don't have to say, I told you five minutes ago, and that was plenty of time for you to eat. Instead, you say, no problem. There's two ways you can go, on your own power or under mine. This time, Marty doesn't need five minutes to decide what's going to happen. Ten seconds is plenty long enough. If he can't make the decision, you make it for him. So you pick up Marty and you head for the car. Now, I make that sound easy, but what's really happening at this point? Is Marty looking up at dad and saying, great parenting style, dad? No, he's probably making a scene. He's kicking, he's screaming, and everybody in the restaurant is looking at you. Let him look. I got news for you. Those parents aren't sitting there thinking what a bad parent you are. They're thinking, thank God that's not my kid. And second, you didn't go into Burger King to form a lasting relationship with all the other parents in that restaurant. But most importantly, there's no easy way to teach your child responsibility. And that lets, leads us to this. Let the consequence be the teacher. So in order to make sure that this is a good learning experience, you have to resist the urge to do the one thing you most want to do. You want to say something. But I want you to consider saying nothing at all. All of us would love to go out to the car and say, I warned you, but you didn't listen to me. Now this is what you get. But this is not the time for words. You know why? Because your child is drunk on emotion. When children get like that, you can't reason with them any more than you can reason with an actual drunk. Save your words for happier time. Besides, I guarantee before the night is over, your kid is going to say something really intelligent. They're going to come up to you and say, I'm hungry. You see, children learn better from what they tell themselves than from what we tell them. So when your kid finally realizes it's important to eat at mealtime, that's the time your kid needs a healthy dose of empathy, not lecture. Sadness on your part will do more to drive the lesson home than angry words will. So when your kid says, I'm hungry, you say, I know, I feel the same way when I miss a meal. But don't worry, we'll fix a big breakfast tomorrow. 
You see, if it's really important to you that your kids eat at mealtime, then you can't rescue them and say, okay, now, honey, what do you want me to fix you to eat? you got to let them face the consequence until the next meal. It's then that you realize that the hardest thing about teaching kids responsibility is that it hurts you more than it does the kid. I hate to see my kids suffer consequences from a poor decision. There, may, there have been many times I prayed, dear God, am I doing the right thing? It's difficult to bite our tongue and let the consequence do the teaching. But let me ask you something. Are we more effective with kids when there's lots and lots of words or not many words? And when we're not very effective with our kids, we tend to use all the words we know. Now think about the story of the prodigal son. In the story in Luke 15, a young man demands his share of the family inheritance so that he could go out on his own. And the father allows the son to make that choice, even though he knows that choice is a bad one. And sure enough, the young man wasted all the money living in the fast lane. But did the father interrupt the process? No. Instead, he let the consequence do the teaching. So the young man hits bottom. He'd blown it all, had nothing to show for it, was completely and abjectly miserable. Do you think it hurt the father to know his son was suffering from his bad choices? Of course it did. Don't you know that he had to fight the tug at his own heart to go and rescue his son from his circumstances? For sure. But the father let the consequence do the teaching, and the boy learned the lesson, and he headed straight for home. Now, what amazes me is what awaited him when he got home. No lectures, not so much as a word, did you learn your lesson? Are you ever going to do that again? just empathy and love. This is how the Father parents us. It's what God does for you and for me. He said, you can choose to follow me or you can choose your own way, but if you choose your own way, you don't get to choose the consequence because the consequence is built into the decision. So as we wrap up, let's talk about this fundamental truth. God doesn't punish his kids. He disciplines them. Now, remember what I said last week, God is the archetype, the original pattern, the flawless design, the one in whose image we are made. Here's the definition I shared with you last week. An archetype is the original pattern or model of which all things of the same type are representations or copies. So God teaches us by word and example how we're to parent, which means the best example of how good parents treat their kids is ultimately how God treats us. If you want to produce maturity in your children, then it takes discipline. But just like this verse is careful to point out, discipline is not the same as punishment. The Bible is very explicit on this one. Listen to this from Hebrews 12. Because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. The Bible tells us when we go astray, God disciplines us because we're his kids, the ones he loves. Punishment, that's reserved for the wicked. God doesn't punish his kids. So here's the rest of the passage from the Message Bible. My dear child, don't shrug off God's discipline, but don't be crushed by it either. It's the child he loved that he disciplines, the child he embraces, he also corrects. The trouble you're in isn't punishment. It's training, the normal experience of children. At the time, discipline isn't much fun. It always feels like it's going against the grain. Later, of course, it pays off handsomely, for it's the well-trained who find themselves mature in their relationship with God. Even when I read to you earlier from the Apostle Paul, I told you to remember this, when he was speaking to dads, he he said, remember, fathers, give your children loving disciplines with, with suggestions and godly advice. The way God the Father disciplines us is the way we're to discipline our kids because he's the archetype, he's the pattern, he's better than any parenting book you're ever going to find. The discipline of God is a hard concept for many of us to understand because we didn't experience loving or appropriate discipline growing up, which causes many of us to equate discipline with punishment. As a believer, my sins were punished on the cross, so I'm never going to be punished for them. Punishment is not for God's kids. Punishment is for evildoers. Or think of it like this. I don't discipline the neighbor's kids because they're not my kids. I mean, I thought about it a time or two, but I still don't do it. We're to treat our children the way God treats us. Once again, the Bible is careful to draw this distinction between discipline and punishment. How about this verse from 1 John 4, 19? There is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear. Why? Because fear has to do with punishment. 
The one who fears is not made perfect in love. So that last phrase, not made perfect, means not mature. So people who fear God as punishing them when bad things happen are still immature in their faith. They don't really understand God's nature. Their lives are not centered in the love of God because the fear of punishment is still their default. God is not punishing you. That's obvious if you actually read the Bible. God disciplines those that he loves. So discipline is not the way God balances the scales. It's not the way God gets even. God got even at the cross. Punishment and discipline are two fundamentally different concepts. Listen to the many ways that punishment is different from discipline. I made a list of these. Punishment is for payback. Discipline is to bring us back. Punishment looks to the past is done in anger. Discipline looks to the future and is done in love. The focus of punishment is toward the past, what you've done wrong. The focus of discipline is toward the future, what you can be. With punishment, I'm paying for the wrongs in the past. With discipline, I'm learning not to repeat my mistakes in the future. The purpose of punishment is to inflict a penalty. The purpose of discipline is to promote growth. The attitude behind punishment is anger. The attitude behind discipline is love. So how do you know whether you're punishing or disciplining your children? Well, look at your attitude while you're doing it. Are you doing it in anger? If you're disciplining your kids to, to, to vent your feelings, then it's not discipline, it's punishment. You're just letting off steam and retaliating. Your irritation has gotten so high that punishment is kind of the relief valve that lets all that steam go. Another way to determine whether or not you're punishing or disciplining your kids is by looking at your child's reaction. Ask yourself, is my child afraid of me? Remember what the Bible says? There is no fear in love. Perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. So when your child is fearful, it's the telltale sign that you're punishing them. Think about it like this. Discipline comes from the word disciple. A disciple is a learner. So discipline is actually the process of learning. If you associate discipline with spanking, you've already missed the boat. By the way, according to researchers, look at this. 10% of parents spank their children, see nothing wrong with it. 20% of parents never spank their kids. And 70% of parents spank their children, but wish they didn't. Now, regardless of where you stand on the issue of spanking, let me share with you a couple of indisputable facts. Number one, if you punish your child three to four times a day for the same misbehavior, then your punishment's not working. And two, if you keep adding to the punishment and the misbehavior continues, the punishment is not working. So like the scripture teaches, God never punishes his kids. We're to treat our children the way God treats us, which means we discipline them. We disciple them. We take them through a process that yields maximum learning. Now, people often say the Bible teaches, spare the rod, spoil the child. But you know, that's actually not a Bible quote. That's a quote from a poem from the early 1600s. The verse they're talking about is actually Proverbs 13, 24. And what that verse says is he that spareth the rod hateth his son. But that, does, that verse doesn't mean beat your child with a rod. The rod is the tool of a shepherd. They used the crook of the rod to lift sheep out of holes that they'd fallen into and used it to guide them along the path. The sheep were never beaten with the rod. Sparing the rod means you're not shepherding your children well. People in an agricultural economy understood the metaphor that a parent must guide his or her child like the shepherd guides a sheep with a rod. Because if you won't give proper direction to your children, like Proverbs says, you must really hate your kids. That's what that verse means. So it's, not talk, it's talking about discipline. It's not talking about punishment. It's about teaching and training and setting an example and giving consequences that help your child learn that every choice has a consequence. Spanking is not discipline. It doesn't teach a child how to be a better person. It's punishment. It creates fear, and children just don't learn in an atmosphere of fear. Think of it like this. Discipline is a function of love because it's not done to them. It's done for them. So God doesn't want us to punish our kids. He wants us to discipline them. God wants us to do for our kids what he does for us. We, we, we want to better equip them to handle this problem the next time they have to face it. Now, true confession here. My dad was a big time believer in yelling and threatening violence. He often used guilt and shame to try to get conformity out of us kids. I was afraid of my father, especially when he was angry. 
You might say, yeah, but you know, you survived it. You turned out okay. What's the big deal? Well, I spent nearly two years in therapy working through my baggage I had with my dad. Let me tell you something. One of the biggest legacies of my father's parenting style is how I carried all of those toxic traits over and superimposed them onto God. I constantly felt like God was disappointed in me, that anything bad that happened to me was God punishing me. Guilt and shame felt normal to me. I'd carried everything in my relationship to dad over to my relationship with my heavenly father. You know why parenting matters so much? Because we're helping to form our child's God image. Parents are the first seminary where a child goes to learn about God. This is why we need to parent our kids in the way God parents us, with loving discipline, helping them make the connection between choices and consequence, like a loving shepherd guiding his sheep through the challenges and the terrain of what we call life. God doesn't punish his kids. He disciplines them. I want them to look to God and see him more clearly because of the kind of father I've been to them. And nothing would pain me more than knowing I became the impediment to them to really knowing God as he is. Moms, dads, we have a very important job to do, to get our children ready for life, to help them connect choice and consequence, to remind them, even as we discipline them, that they're loved incredibly by us, that, w- that we hurt when they hurt. Because ultimately, they're going to see God first through the lens of mom and dad. Let's pray. Father, I, I come to you just so aware, so incredibly aware, that how we discipline and lead our children not only prepares them for life, but prepares them for a relationship with you. And God, I've made mistakes along the way. There have been times, especially early on, before I got into therapy, before I began to face my own issues, that that my children often saw my anger, and I parented the way I was parented. And Lord, I have in brokenness apologized and taken responsibility of that to my kids so many times, that they had a father who was broken, and that that should have never happened at all. And I pray, God, that you would continue the work of healing them and drawing them deeply into yourself, into your heart. I thank you, God, that you began to set me free from that toxicity, and I began to see you as I never have before. I just can't help but thank God that there's somebody listening to me right now who knows what it's like to to live in a home that uh, they experience violence, that they experience unpredictability, that, that their life was like a storm at sea and they never knew when that storm was going to make landfall. And Lord, because of that, there's, there's a certain level of, of damaging of their soul, of damaging the way they see you. God, you are so unlike that. That God, what we see in your word again and again, just like in the story of the prodigal son, yes, you'll let us make our choices. Yes, we will suffer the consequence for every choice, but that's just built into the choice. But when we come around and we return, what we receive is not a lecture. What we, what we get is not a beat down. What we get, God, is love that's flowing from your heart and acceptance and a warm embrace. God, I pray that I can parent the way you parent, that I would understand that my job as a parent is to disciple my children, to teach them, to help them to learn, to help them make the connection between choice and consequence. Help me, God, not to get in the way of that by being a rescuer, by coming in, swooping in, and taking away a learning opportunity for my child when the price tag is still very affordable. Help me not to be the kind of parent that just avoids things, that dismisses things, that that says it's just harmless kid stuff. And yet at the same time, God, those things begin to eat away at us and destroy our children's lives. And God, help me not to be the drill sergeant parent, the overreactor, the one who just blows up at, at, at what I see and, and using guilt and shame and, and using fear to get compliance out of my kids. All I'm doing in that is scoring a Pyrrhic victory. It's a victory in the moment, but I'm losing the war because of what I'm doing to my child. 
So God, I pray that you would help us all to kind of look deeply in the mirror today, to look into your truth, to look into your word and understand that this is one of the most important lessons that every one of us has to learn. What Galatians 6, 7 says, that we reap what we sow. And that Lord, that is a natural teacher that you've built into our environment. If we take it to heart, we will become responsible people. And if we don't, then God, we will pay the price and that price will become more severe. So God, I pray for all of us, for those of us who need to do business with you and just ask your forgiveness for how we've made mistakes in the past and to go to our kids and ask for the same thing. For those of us who are in the thick of parenting challenge right now, that we find ourselves having to look at whether or not we are rescuers, whether we are avoiders, whether we are overreactors, God, that we would see that, that we would own that, and that God, we would learn that there's a better way. And most of all, God, I pray for all those who are really struggling in this moment, who are really, who, who know because of what they experience as a child, that there's a certain level of, of damage when it comes to their God image, that Lord, they would see you clearly through your word, through example, through your truth, that we would know you as you are. And God, when we know that truth, just like Jesus said, the truth will set us free. Thank you. In Jesus name. Amen. Always grateful that you would join us anytime that you're joining, whether you're joining us live on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock online, or whether you're joining us sometime during the week. If this message has made a difference for you, then I'm asking you just out of abundant grace, would you share this, share it through your social media so that others might connect with these life-changing truths. God bless you. I pray it's a great week.